Good evening or good morning, wherever you are in the world. I'm Regina Yao, and I'm moderating the seventh Google Hangout session of the fifth International Women's Day edition of our Read for Pixels campaign. So through Read for Pixels, the Pixel Project is collaborating with 14 award-winning, best-selling women writers to raise awareness about violence against women and to raise funds for the Pixel Project to keep our efforts to end violence against women alive and kicking as well as help us reveal the first mystery celebrity male role model portrait team male role model pixel reveal campaign we'll be telling you more about the reefer pixels fundraiser which has lots and lots of exclusive author goodies a little later in the session and you can find out more about the pixel project and balance against women and how to stop it by visiting www.thepixelproject.net and we'll be telling you more about the Read for Pixels. Uh, and we have a very special guest today. Sorry about that. We have a very special guest today um, for our live Read for Pixels discussion and Q&A session, the fabulous fantasy author, Liana Renee Heber. Uh, Liana writes historical fantasy novels for Tor and Kensington books, such as The Strangely Beautiful Saga, The Eternal Files Trilogy, and the Spectral City series. A classically trained actress featured in film and television, Liana has created and tours a one woman show portraying 19th century designer, Clara Driscoll. So Liana, before we go to her reading, Liana has, gener uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Liana's goodies. She has generously donated some absolutely gorgeous treats to the stash of author goodies we have up as perks for US-based donors at the Read for Pixels Rally Up fundraising page. So the first one is the Spectral City Goodie Bundle, and there are three of those. Uh, in them, you have one signed and personalized copy of the Spectral City novel, um, one personal note from Deanna, uh, two signed bookmarks, and one signed card, I believe. Um, and there's a luxury Spectral City handcrafted cameo goodie bundle, and there's only one of those. Um, so there's a signed and personalized copy of Spectral City in it, um, a personal note from Liana, signed bookmarks, a signed card, and the piece, the piece of um, jewelry, a piece of jewelry featuring a reclaimed, a restored vintage cameo pendant necklace personally handcrafted by Liana, and which has a themed relevance to her books. And then we also have the luxury, the third goodie is the luxury Spectral City handcrafted vintage necklace goodie bundle. There's also only one of the, these. Um, it has all the same goodies as the Cameo goodie bundle, except that the jewelry is a vintage pendant necklace, and it is handcrafted by Liana herself as well. And it is linked to her books. So if you want something a little smaller, or if you have not read Liana's books before, Liana also has three ebook copies of the Spectral City just ready to send to donors as well. Um, and let me tell you, it is a really, really fantastic read if you love spooky mystery detective stories with ghosts in them and psychics solving mysteries um and there's only a limited number of these exclusive bundles and liana is putting them herself so she's personally gonna pack everything up and send them straight to you and so if you are interested um please go donate it donate for it at our rally our fundraising page our um producer today raised $1,575 to its $5,000 goal, and the fundraiser will end on April 15th. So please give generously to help us reach our fundraising target. All funds go towards supporting our work to end violence against women. Um, and if you are watching this session on YouTube right now, you will be able to ask Liana questions live. 
Just make sure you are logged into your YouTube account so that you can type your questions into the chat, into the chat box to the right of the YouTube screen. And Michelle, who's today's producer and chat box moderator, will relay them to me to, to read out to Liana to answer. And now let's put Liana on screen. Welcome, Liana, to Read for Pixel. Hello. Hello. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so you are going to read something from uh, the Spectral City for us today, I believe. Yes, I am. So Spectral City is the first book in this series set in 1899, so right before the 20th century begins. So it'll end of the 19th century. It's New York City. It's the Gilded Age. And I'm going to read a scene from within the Ghost Precinct. Eve Whitby, my heroine, is a very bold, very smart young woman who has been able to see and speak with ghosts. She's actually been quite plagued by ghosts since she was a child. So rather than be overwhelmed by them, she's chosen to work with them because they have a perspective on life and on clues and on solving mysteries that the living does not have. So she's realized that they're actually quite helpful in trying to solve a mystery. So she creates the ghost precinct and she has several women who work with her as fellow psychics and mediums. And they work on an off the books branch of the New York Police Department. Now, historically speaking, the New York Police Department started to have police matrons on the force, helping to sort of corral and deal with female inmates around 1880. So there were women that were working in the force, but women's roles within the force were very, very limited, as you can even see from the title of police matron. It was very much a everyone in their lane and everyone in their respective role kind of place. So Eve and the presence of the ghost precinct, even though it's not widely advertised, um, she still comes up against some um, some detractors, shall we say. So I'm going to just read a little bit of a scene within the office when Eve gets one of her first complaints from a higher up person within the department and how she deals with that. And then later it will transition to eyes who comes in and you'll see that dynamic because one of the things that I'm very passionate about building in my work is building a good team that works together because I think that's the only way to solve any kind of problem. So without any further ado, I'm going to jump right in. This is from about 50 pages in. Um, you'll get a sense of some of these side characters. The, the women and the ghosts that I'm mentioning in this section, all, both the living and the dead, work together to try to solve mysteries. So they're already engaged in some conversation when this complaint comes in. But other than that, you should, you should be good to go. All right. How many detectives even know about the ghost precinct to be able to lodge a complaint about us? Cora asked. Well, that's a fair question, Eve murmured. She thought about the gala, the attendees where she'd been presented. There were maybe 10 people from the department total that were there. Despite the initial call for discretion, perhaps Governor Roosevelt had boasted of the department beyond the usual channels. I can't be sure, Eve replied finally. Not many, but enough to make any friend to the lieutenant a possible snitch. What they don't necessarily know about is some of our protocols. I'll not have our every move subjected to an ethics board. We have complete plausible deniability and a solid alibi about the night in question, Antonia, another of the psychics, said. Cora, Jenny and I were at the theater and you were at that gala. Antonia, just let me do the talking, Eve explained. Let me be the front of this. Antonia's dark eyes flashed defensively and she opened her mouth as if to retort, but closed it again, a pain crossing over her olive complexion. Eve, trying not to tread upon anxiety regarding presentation, clarified gently, Please don't misunderstand me. I want no one to feel hidden behind me for any reason, but I must bear the brunt of scrutiny. That's what being the director of the precinct means. Antonia's brow remained furrowed. 
You are all my charges and my responsibility, Eve added. I asked for this to make sense of my life and to retain my sanity. Let me be what I am made for and support me as is needed. I have armor that won't I was forged in childhood when I had to decide if the gifts would kill me or make me their soldier. So let me fight for all of us. Her colleagues, her colleagues each nodded. A rough knock on the door. Eve answered it and a barrel-chested man in uniform entered, his action suiting his frame as he strode into the room. Vera, the ghost, wafted towards the wall, hovering in the same dimensions as a file cabinet, and she watched. I don't give any part of a rat's anatomy what you ladies think you're doing in this fanciful department, the short-haired, burly man stated. But if you send your spooky minions into good people's fine homes, you're going to find the full weight of the NYPD against you. Certainly not behind you, as our former chief, Mr. Roosevelt, would like to have you believe. And you are? Eve prompted. The man pointed to his badge. Sergeant Maloney. Yes, I can read. Eve replied. I just assumed you'd do us the courtesy, as your colleagues, of introducing yourself like a gentleman. You want manners? The gruff man frowned. Why'd you join a bunch of officers? Go have a seance in a ladies' parlor and be done with wasting our time. Who complained to you to warrant this? Cora asked, Eve second in command, her nostrils flaring. Her light brown face was flushed with frustration. Eve held out a hand. We, we don't know anything about the nature of your complaint, Eve clarified, trying to keep an edge from her tone. That's not germane to the discussion. Well, of course it is, Eve countered, stepping forward. How can we avoid something if we know nothing about it? Of course you know about it. You sent a ghost in to go snooping. Eve cocked her head to the side. To be fair, Sergeant, only a fraction of the city's ghostly goings on have anything to do with us. It is a very big city, New York, a very haunted big city. We work with some seven to at most 10 of the thousands that float about the boroughs. The Prenz family is off limits, Mahoney declared. They are boons to the police and we owe them our thanks. Consider this a warning with no second chances. Barging in, demanding, accusing and threatening, all with no proof nor details and all in one breath, Eve said in awe of the confidence it took to be so rude. Like I said, you don't like it? Get, yes, leave the force. Yes, I heard you the first time. I'll have you know I've not authorized anything related to the name Prenz. We'll be sure not to trouble such a helpful family with any of our direct actions should they come to our attention. However, if their house is just simply haunted, don't rush to accuse us. Take that up with an exorcist. I know too, I can make a referral if you like. He harumphed and exited. Good day, Mr. Mahoney, she called after him. All the girls' fists were clenched. Vera the ghost cursed after him in Spanish with a wide, emphatic gesture, wafting forward to Eve's side and making the papers on her desk float away with the breeze. It was clear Vera hadn't been noticed by Mahoney, per Eve's orders, as none of them knew how much the spirit world affected everyday folk. When their office had the company of ghosts, their orders were to keep their profiles low. So how do we surreptitiously spy on this Prenz family. No one is that threatening who's doing the right thing, Antonia stated. Eve held up her hands. I agree. Such an unwarranted attack dog is suspicious in and of itself, but we must proceed carefully if at all. We've hardly any friends. We can't afford enemies and I'm sure Mahoney's banking on it. Vera, was this the family in question? that you were speaking of? Were you in the Prenz mansion regarding that post-mortem photograph you found? The ghost, still fuming over the man, whirled towards Eve, sending a chill on the air as she moved, and Eve saw her own breath come out in a cloud. Oh, I've no idea, the ghost responded. I'm sorry, I was so caught up, I didn't look at any of the papers. It was a townhouse, no mansion, but I didn't get names, the girls groaned. Vera, you know protocol. 
how else can we follow up without a name or an address? And how can how else can we be careful after this complaint? I got carried away the go to and fro in a nervous spectral pace. There was another knock, more timid. Eve went to the door and opened it just a crack. Detective Horowitz was outside, standing with his arms behind his back and a pleasant, hopeful, not to be troublesome look on his sharp featured face. Seeing Eve, he bought her gaze, and the bright light of the day streaming in from outside the windows highlighted the flecks of blue in his light chestnut eyes, a dynamic touch to his visage. Hello, detective, do come in, Eve stated. His manner was the opposite of the man before him, and Eve found herself relieved at the contrast, though surprised that the detective sought her out. How can we help you? She asked. She thought to offer him tea or coffee, but... She didn't want to give anyone the impression her department were glorified maids or secretaries. Do you know the rest of my associates? He shook his head and Eve introduced her colleagues who all turned back to their desks after bobbing their heads, a subtle reminder that they were all professionals at work. Eve gestured Horowitz towards her desk where a plain wooden chair sat opposite. Mr. Bonhoff is leaving New York, the detective said, taking his seat and surveying her desk carefully. Eve, thunderstruck by this news, sunk into her chair across the desk. Out of the corner of her eye, Eve noticed that the ghost, little Zofia, had wafted in and come to float by Jenny, her usual favorite haunt, who ignored her at her small desk, both ghost and living child keeping their eyes focused on the detective. Vera frowned, folding herself back to the file cabinets again. Eve tried to keep her face neutral. Her dearest champion, Mr. Bonhoff, was liaison to Governor Roosevelt and to the chief of police, and he knew every step of the delicate dance of advocating for working women in men's fields. Perhaps that's why the complaint, more like the threat, had been so easy, easily and flippantly leveled the moment that Mr. Bonhoff was gone whether there were grounds on the family's behalf or not. Roosevelt spoke to those of us detectives and officers who know about you, that 10 or 12 or so at your reception, to choose a liaison to replace him. I volunteered immediately. Ah, Eve tried to keep her face expressionless. Needing something with which to busy herself, she moved to a tea tray and poured herself some, gesturing to a row of cups hanging from the hooks upon a wall. The detective shook his head. I anticipated your disappointment, he stated after a moment. Eve forced a small, conciliatory smile as she returned to her chair with tea. No, it isn't that. I I am, well, I, I was fond of Mr. Bonhoff, you see. I am aware Mr. Bonhoff was a great advocate for you, and I have no intention of proving otherwise. But I will say that I'm not as enamored of the secrecy in which you work as you are. I believe a liaison should be more involved. Eve bristled, sitting up straight, practically floating at the edge of her chair, trying not to notice the whispers of disapproval from the present ghosts, whom Horowitz appeared oblivious to. Secrecy is for everyone's safety, Eve replied, for myriad reasons. Reasons I'm sure I'll appreciate, but I would like initial transparency here. We're entirely transparent, detective. Vera stated, wafting a bit closer, unable to help herself. The detective cocked his head. What was that? Eve flashed a look at Vera and bit back a chuckle. Vera here, one of our ghostly operatives, made a joke about transparency. Eve waited to laugh. He did not. You mean one is present right now? He asked, his bright eyes widening. He raked a hand through warm brown curls. Oh, yes, she's right behind you. Eve replied. For a moment, it seemed as though you heard her speak. It's best if you don't second guess it. The detective whipped his head behind him, frowned, then turned around and shuddered. I feel something, a chill, but it's likely just a breeze, he declared. He crossed his arms as if punctuating his denial. No, that's Vera. Ghosts bring a delicate frost with them. Wherever they go, I maintain that everyone has the capacity to hear and see spirits, Eve countered, and most certainly to feel them. It's just trained out of most people. Like any sense, she gestured to her colleagues, ours is more highly calibrated. So you'll have to remind me 
what you can and can't ascertain detective, as I take for granted that my department is all of the same skill set. She looked at him pointedly, the intruder. He just nodded, taking no offense. Can you see them in any way, she asked. He looked behind him tentatively again. Vera waved. A more unruly curl on the top of his head bounced. If I were to presume I saw a spectral entity or movement, it would likely be the extremely potent power of suggestion at work. We must be careful not to let fanciful notions run away with themselves, he replied carefully. Is that what you think of this department? Eve said with an arch of her brow squaring her shoulders. Fanciful notions? No, Horowitz replied honestly. Eve set her jaw. Is something wrong? Horowitz asked, looking at the women. You all seem to be out of sorts, and I don't think it's just me who has ruffled communal feathers. Eve sighed. Among several concerns, we dealt with a complaint this morning, and a positive boor of a sergeant yelled at us for something we know nothing about, blaming us for some sort of spectral meddling we didn't order. I'm sorry. Horowitz said earnestly. I dealt with a complaint from the same boor just yesterday myself. I'd bet money it was Mahoney, wasn't it? He's on a rampage trying to get promoted. What was he on about? Eve asked. Maybe I won't feel so targeted if you commiserate with me. I was pointedly told by a family member of a deceased victim that they did not want a Horowitz's mouth thinned as he took a moment to deliberately choose more delicate words, the truth biting behind the flash of his eyes. He gestured. Let's just say they proceeded to hurl every Jewish slur and absurd misapprehension in their house. They didn't want me in their house, let alone working the case of their dearly departed. Eve's hand went to her sternum. That's horrific. All Eve's precinct nodded and offered empathetic noises. As Horowitz had spoken, they had all stood, almost as if ready to fight for this man's dignity. Vera muttered in Spanish. Eve didn't know the language, but she didn't have to. The spirit regularly cursed cruelty and intolerance. It took a lot to raise Vera's hackles. That was the second time today, and it wasn't even noon. Let me be honest with you all, Horowitz stated. I volunteered to be the liaison because I heard an epithet being used towards you collectively yesterday, likely from the same part of the department that lodged your complaint. I promise I will stand in the way of such hateful ignorance if it's the last thing I do, for your sake, for my own, for all of us working in this city made from a thousand cities. I may be skeptical of your methods and practices, but not of your right to respect. Thank you, Eve stated. We need to stand together, not divided. Agreed, Horowitz said, rising. And now I am sure we all have work to do. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that book. That's you know when, when we when we were doing the when, when we were doing the um, uh, practice session, yeah it it is it does still it does capture what so many women and minorities today still face in the workplace, which is a lot of discrimination and a lot of a, a lot of victim blaming. Whenever anything goes wrong at work, it's just horrible. Um, so let's go to the first uh, set of questions today. Um, okay. Your book features a wide range of female characters who are independent, intelligent, and determined women and girls from different walks of life. And they go through tough personal journeys. So it's like characters like Eve and her all-female team of psychics in the Spectral City. So who and what are the inspirations behind your female characters? Well, one of the things that I want to celebrate is the fact that women's rights really came into the foreground at during the 19th century. And even though women didn't get the right to vote until the 20th century, women had been working on this for a very long time. So I want to just celebrate 
women in the workforce, especially in the middle to the late Victorian era, new technologies were opening up. Like I'd mentioned earlier, there's a police matron, uh, the first police matrons were added to the force in, in 1880. And this is 19 years after that. And so I just want to, you know, talk about something that is still relevant in many fields today. But these were our foremothers who were breaking barriers in a time that was additionally restrictive when women had even less laws to protect them and even less rights at that point. But they were still bold um, and they were still confident people that were going out and doing their their work. And one of the reasons why I choose to use ghost stories as a way to enable my heroines to have their own personal agency and a say over their lives is because the interest in seances and the interest in spiritualism was very much entwined with the women's rights movement. Women who were spiritualists, who were talking with uh, the dead, whether it was, whether they were for real and gifted or whether they were charlatans taking advantage of something that was popular, spiritualism gave women a platform to talk in public in a way that was not common or allowed very often. So spiritualism and being this sort of um, spiritual and psychic resource was sort of a new avenue for women to be able to be experts and authorities. So from the 1840s on, we see a rise in women as public figures within the spiritualist movement. In fact, that is where Victoria Woodhull got her start as a public figure. Victoria Woodhull was the first woman in the United States to run for president in 1872. So that's many years before this novel. So it's not like women weren't trying to get into politics and it's not like women weren't trying to use whatever avenue they could whether legitimate psychic or just using it as a way to get an audience. Um, I just think that's fascinating. It's not, you know, feminism is not a modern thing. You know, women's rights, it's not a modern thing. There have been women across the globe, you know, trying to make sure that we are seen as equal humans since the dawn of time. So, um, I, and I think for me, I'm very interested in the 19th century because it's a very dynamic part of history when things started to really change um, in terms of the way that new in industries opened up different opportunities for all kinds of things. And it was very fascinating in New York City, where I live and where I'm a tour guide, because that's when we really start to get diversity from all around the world coming to try to make a life happen and to, to make a go of it in New York City. And it's just a very interesting, um, vibrant dynamic. And I, I love working with it. Yeah. And you know, none of your female characters are typical fantasy heroines. You know, they, none of them are. They have learning curves, they make mistakes. And as we can see from the excerpt that you read out to us, they get frustrated by men trying to control a thought or manipulate them. So in other words, the experiences very much mirror our experiences, even today, you know, as women in the workforce. Um, so based on what you said, just that was just, was this a conscious decision on your part to portray them this way or did they all evolve organically as characters? One of the things that I wanted to write in The Spectral City, because all of my books are related in that you don't have to have read my other series to jump into Spectral City, but I do have crossover characters. Each one of my series, however, has a different tone. It has a different feel. Like my Strangely Beautiful series is very much high fantasy and I deal with things like uh, Greek mythology uh, bleeding onto the streets of, of London in 1888 at the time of Jack the Ripper. Um, I ha my young adult series is very firmly in a young adult genre. My, um, my Eterna Files is much more like a almost espionage and it's a huge cast of characters and it's, it's definitely high fantasy with a lot of different kinds of supernatural goings on. With The Spectral City, I really wanted to write essentially a police procedural with ghosts, with the paranormal, a paranormal procedural, because uh, I love watching cop shows. I love watching police dramas. They're my favorite shows. 
And I really been liking some of the character development that it's not just about the crimes. What, why I watch is to watch the dynamics between the people in the workforce who are trying to figure out their team dynamic. And they face a lot of obstacles, whether they're trying to get promoted. And this is, you know, whether it's no matter how these people identify as men or women or non-binary, I think that there's, um, there's always a frustration with all kinds of institutions, no matter you know what you we all work with, we're all going to come up against some kind of conflict. So I think it's really relatable um, to have a sort of a workplace frustration. I think that's something that all of us can relate to. And so with that, I wanted to kind of infuse that into my work because I hadn't had that sort of day in, day out sort of procedural aspect. And I wanted to merge a couple of my favorite things with this book, um, the show Medium with Patricia Arquette. I love that show. And I love her as a medium who's consulting for the police. But then my one of my favorite novels is The Alienist by Caleb Carr, which is a great historical mystery, dark historical mystery set in New York City. And it's meticulously researched and it's really beautifully written. Um, but the the women in that book also are facing, you know, trying to be trailblazers and they're facing limitations too, um, but very strong characters there. So I kind of wanted to merge those ideas and kind of give homage. All of my books sort of give an homage to things that I love and genre tropes that I love. And so that I idea of the team dynamics of each one of my psychics and also the dynamic with Detective Horowitz, who is charming and wonderful and I'm completely in love with him. Um, he's he's just, he's one of my favorite characters um, because he really understands, you know, he, he's coming from a marginalization too. And so I'm also trying to build allies. Every time I write a book, it's about building a, a team together because I really believe that that's the only way that we as a world are gonna survive is if we, if, is if we try to figure out how to make a, a good team. Yeah, and you know, I noticed that when, I read quite a lot of urban fantasy, which I think the Spectral City also does fall, mm -hmm. have a foot in urban fantasy. And I noticed that oh, when, when authors combine urban fantasy with police procedural um, format, um, a lot of the issues that you talk about that um, Eve and her team of psychics are facing it all comes out the forefront because it's all about the workplace and how they negotiate the dynamics in the workplace in order to effectively solve a case right and, and it's kind of my favorite part sometimes because you know the case the cases will change and the cases will sort of come and go but these relationships you know you're re you know i'm a very character driven novelist the characters are every everything and everything else is kind of the character and the setting in which they they live and exist. I love painting a scene. I love setting historic New York alive for the reader. And that's in this section, we didn't get a chance to really see the scene setting, but that's one of my favorite things about writing in the 19th century is painting that backdrop of the city. So I walk those city streets as a tour guide and walk by some of these historic buildings every day and they just capture my heart and I want to share that with the reader. But yeah, it's that the the workplace dynamics inevitably come forward because it really is that that's the constant. Everything else is changeable. Yeah, and and um, I was just thinking that you know, I recently just finished reading Circle of the Moon by Faith Hunter, and oh, it, yeah, and it's also a soup. Uh, it's a paranormal uh, police procedural thing yes. with a team of um, a team of supernatural uh, people and. Um, uh, the lead character now is, I think, a wood nymph or part, part wood nymph. And uh, she deals with a lot of the same issues that Eve de deals with in the course yeah. of her work, you know, with male superiors yeah. who, and this is in the 21st century, it's still the mm -hmm. same thing. She, she had to sit her new male boss down and give him what for because he was going to place blame on her on stuff yeah. that he was dealing with because it didn't make him look good. And it's the same thing with Mahoney, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. it's the same issue, you know? They yeah, get and I, I think it's so relatable to, to everybody is that, you know, superiors not wanting to like, you know, take any blame. I think that's, I think that that's, you know, I, I think we, we all want 
to things to be fair, but very often in institutions, things aren't fair necessarily. So I think it's a common, you know, complaint and it's something that all of us can kind of get behind. Yeah, it's kind of sad that, you know, after like, with a difference of almost 200 years between the spectral city and circle of the moon in terms of, um, in terms of time period, it's still the same issue. And at work, we still face the same issue with dealing with women, dealing with uh, minorities, dealing with bosses, especially male bosses who, you know, want to control the power dynamic in the, in the mm -hmm. world. Absolutely. Well, and you're and yeah, you're hitting the right word there. It is about the power dynamic. So I'm in all of my books, I'm trying to find a power dynamic between my teammates that's balanced and fair. Um, but also that gets work done and also that gets the job done. Because sometimes you do need a domineering presence to get things moving forward, but that doesn't mean at the cost of someone else's dignity. Yeah. And you know, that we're talking about how your characters are typical fantasy heroines. So different authors answer this differently. Basically, how do you break these stereotypes in the genre to create female characters of agency? So what are your methods for doing that? Well, I love the traditional old school gothic tropes in terms of I love playing with them. So I love, you know, the idea of this dark and stormy night and I love lots of sort of drama. Um, but I, I, I like my characters not taking themselves too seriously, even if they're in a very serious situation. They're, I, I like to confront a certain um, self-deprecatory uh, way to, to deal with things. And whether it's other characters who kind of check them or uh, whether it's other characters are motivating them to be their better selves. So for me, I try to break down stereotypes by just letting my characters be really fully human and having lots of different types of facets to them. And sometimes I don't know that right away. So I just really take time getting to know them. I have a theater background. And so my theater background as an actor really helps me build character because I get into their head and I think about their motivations. I think about what makes them tick. I think about how they move and how they're, they see the world, much like I'm taking on a character that I would be portraying on stage. And there's something to that that allows it to have a lived in feel. And then I'm not dealing with a two dimensional trope, I'm dealing with a real full person. And I think that, um, and I wanna keep challenging myself to make sure that I'm not just resorting to tropes. And so when something like the Gothic is sometimes very two dimensional, it's got, you know, you've got uh, almost melodramatic things going on. So so you want to, I, I, I try to walk a fine line while it's still kind of fun to be on that edge of melodrama, but I try to also be very self-aware about it. And so the great thing about writing paranormal things within a 19th century context is that there was not really a social etiquette book or a manners book in this highly restrictive, very gender role driven society about how to deal with the paranormal. Even though the, the 19th century folks were fascinated by the paranormal, there wasn't really a rule book of how to deal with it. So it sort of gives a bit of a workaround for my characters to be like, well, you know, there's not really in the lady's handbook for how to be a proper lady. There's not really a whole thing about demonic possession. So we're just going to have to wing this one. And so I think that there is this sense of, well, we have to take this on ourselves because also no one else is going to believe us. So that's the other thing too, that's almost sadly too relatable is the idea of believing women. Um, and so my, my characters are um, struggling with how much do I share because I won't be believed and how much do I just do myself? And it's really because they fear that they won't be believed that a lot of them end up taking into their own hands things that, you know, are dangerous, but they don't feel like they have another choice. So, and I try to still make them feel like they're making the best choice for themselves and a brave one. And I make sure that they don't do it alone. I mean, it's really, I build a community so that none of my characters are facing an uphill battle. None of them are doing it alone. They have to find the strength within themselves, but they have encouraging people along the way. I'm really big about 
friendships uh, at the core of my work and about female friendships and mentorships too. I love my elder characters um, of, of all stripes and all different backgrounds and all identities that work with my younger characters to try and make sure that they have a support system and found, found family basically. Yeah, and you know, female friendship is a theme that hasn't been tackled a lot, hasn't been presented a lot in fantasy, actually, or science fiction, for that matter. Mm -hmm. And um, it is, you know, besides you, there have only been, um, I think, two or three other authors that we've had on Read for Pixels who specifically put the spotlight on female friendship. And here's the thing, I think, um, you know, women tend to, if, if left to organize you know, start and organize companies and organizations. And, you know, we tend to think in terms of working in teams. So yeah. like you said that we're never alone. And um, basically, sorry, the dog is barking. <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> That's all right. So, so the dog has something to say too. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, the dog is, um, the dog's uh, nemesis, the postman must be here. So. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, at least you know, at least you have a, a, a wonderful uh, alarm system then. Yeah, only for the postman. Uh, <laughs> so, fair. you know, so ba basically, you know, women do work in teams. And, and one of the things that people notice about, I mean, Captain Marvel is out right now. And one of the things oh, that yeah. people notice about it great. is the friendship between, yes. between, uh, between Carol and Marie. Because oh, it's so beautiful. They just picked it up after Carol had gone missing for a decade. She comes it's back. It's so beautiful. And that that friendship was so... I They did a marvelous job, both the writers and the actors, in creating an instant, you know, emotional uh, reaction. And they just... They had very limited time to really set that up. But the way that they did, it was wonderful and really fulfilling. Um, especially introducing Monica. I thought that was absolutely incredible. And I loved how that really was the same kind of um, strong bond then that she begins to develop with Nick Fury too. And I love that there's this sort of team bonding experience that's happening both from this ret like return to somebody that she knew and loved, even if she doesn't remember everything about it. But, and then the, and then what she's building with, with fury and i think that that's that's just such a it's for me it's so rewarding because the the other superhero movies haven't been quite as much about building a friendship it's about you know it's about all of the team folks doing their part in the team which i love i love the team building of the avengers as it as um you know an example but i really liked this kind of starting from from scratch uh, in in building these things with people who are very wary um, and so I thought it struck a really nice balance of humor and pathos throughout all of that. And I, and it's that for me, the building the team and, and making new friends in adverse circumstances, that is my, my favorite kind of thing. And I will say that is one of the things that of this, this book has, um, the spectral city has really resonated with people because the female friendship angle, it's one of the things that gets mentioned in almost every review that's come out is how how much people appreciate the focus on the female friendships and that each of these side characters, each from very different backgrounds, each gets their fair due and uh, explanation of who they are and what's driving them and what's rooting them. And they each have a different specialization too. And that's, that's what's great. You know, I don't want somebody who's good at absolutely everything that no one can, again, no one can do this all on their own. And I'm not interested in, in stories where it's just one person's burden as it were so i'm much more interested in how do these puzzle pieces fit together but that's very male isn't it the one person's burden you know i'm going to go save the world i'm the savior it, it is it is such a it is such a ongoing entrenched fantasy trope and you know everything to do in the story is to do remote it, it, it's to happen to you know incite you know the next the next scene and the story for him but when right. but something something really interesting happens when we shift the focus to female characters and female friendships because a lot of what a lot of fantasy does not like i said female friendship and fantasy is only just starting to come to the fore and what people don't understand 
understand, I think a lot of, is that women have, since time immemorial, forged all these networks based on friendship, based on communal needs. Yeah. Because the men, in some cases, the men go off to war and they might not come back. Or in other cases, the men are just deadbeat dads. They're not going to help lift the finger to help. Or they might be part of, you know, like in Imperial China, they might be part of a whole community of concubines and wives. And, you know, and to survive, you need to be friends to survive all the protocol, all the sexism, all the misogyny. And, you know, and, and that's why it's so nice to see Captain Marvel acknowledge and build a female friendship on screen because that is that hasn't really happened in many um, superhero films at all. Mainstream superhero. No, and I, yeah, I think I think anytime you start to break down um, things beyond gender roles and just start to kind of open up what's possible in storytelling, it doesn't have to be this one this one person's heroic quest, when you start to really allow for more different iterations as how to get a problem solved, as every book is, every book is solving a problem for the main characters. Um, I think it's, you know, the there's so many different options and I really love playing in a sandbox where I bring in a whole lot of, of people uh, from, again, all walks of life to try and get that problem solved. Because for me, it's in, in infinitely more interesting that way and my characters are teaching me something you know every step of the way and i do think that you know how we are societized um has a lot to do with how we present uh our fiction uh, i think your our our worldview is going to be you know it's in, inextricable um our various identities it, it all goes into our work and not to say that anything is autobiographical because it's not but i definitely enjoy uh, bringing to the forefront things about the way that I've been societized as a woman that are positive and that and the community building aspect is a great thing about that and I wouldn't change that for anything and so it's just about bringing that to the forefront and being like hey actually this really this this whole hey we can build a team um this really works and and I for me it's all about positive affirmation um, you know, I'm never going to portray something solely as negative. I mean, even even Sergeant Mahoney, he later on, we find out about his backstory and why, you know, in the next book, you're going to see a turn with this guy who he he has to confront a couple of things and he um, he starts to become an, a an ally for them, um, you know, in a way that we wouldn't have expected. And we, we understand about why he's skeptical about um, the ghost precinct because of some something that that he a tragedy that befell him so everybody has reasons sometimes for why they might not be at their best but it doesn't mean that you have to accept that it doesn't mean that that's how you that you just sort of you know um, take it and my characters don't but at the same time, there's there's room for growth, and so I, I want to kind of you know try to put that focus on those positive uh, interactions and put those at the fore, almost as examples of like, hey, this is how it can be, you know, because the de the dynamic that develops between Detective Horowitz as an ally with the team, they were they all work really well together. So it doesn't have to be you know again, this stuff doesn't have to be gen, and so we can just think about things as people, and mm -hmm. I really think that that'll help a lot towards uh, there being less um, contentiousness and less um, venom out in the world at large. You know, speaking of Detective Horowitz, um, you know, do you think reframing how stories describe men away from hostile and toxic stereotypes and towards complexity and even vulnerability, uh, do you think it can be one of the ways science fiction and fantasy writers can break away from the toxic tropes that promote toxic masculinity and the dehumanization of women? Exactly. That is it. I one of the reasons why I write the types of team dynamics that I write is to show positive, affirming, loving, and and interesting, you know, dynamics between men and women and um, and also, you know, however folks identify non-binary folks too. So I think that like there's, for me, it's, you know, 
toxicity is toxicity, no matter you know where it goes. It's all um, and again, society and societization, uh, gender roles are limiting for everybody. So trying to break those down and allowing for there to be different types of people in general and, and trying not, not to gender emotions, trying not to gender particular qualities of how someone acts or is or who they love or how, you know, I think getting away from um, trying to kind of put people into boxes is good for everybody. And so I really try to make sure that all of my characters have the same amount of agency, no matter how my characters identify, I want them all to have the same chances and I want them to all have the same ability to work together in a non-toxic environment because that's really what I would want for the world is, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who would really like for there to be world peace. So um, I, I, you know, and not that my books are some sort of like kumbaya song, it's not. My books have lots of action adventure and yes, there's a high body count in many of them. So, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, it is at the end of the day, I, I don't wanna focus on the toxicity because I, you know, I have a lot of wonderful of all kinds of different identities and, and I, I don't have much toxicity in my life at all. I don't, you know, because I, I curate my life to not have it. It doesn't mean I don't still deal with the occasional thing out and about, you know, but I really try to make sure that my life is full of the same kinds of affirming people that I try to write, because I do think that that creates a positive momentum to, to set health, to help set healthy examples. I mean, I had to learn that along the way about what was toxic and what wasn't in friendships and in relationships and things like that. But um, I really think it's important for there to be, you know, um, positive, fun, motivating, quirky, interesting examples of all kinds for people. Yeah, I want people to see themselves and I want the people to be able to see themselves in my fiction, no matter how they want to see the world. Yeah. Do you think eventually the, the violent alpha male type character will phase out of science fiction and fantasy as, you know, right now the, the whole discussion worldwide is kicking out toxic masculinity, especially, you know, with it's behind so much grief, so much violence, like the recent attack on the uh, in, in Christchurch, New Zealand. Do you think so there will be a time when this sort of character would just be phased out? Or do you think the stereotype would just stick around for much longer than expected? I I think that a certain amount of, of violence will always be a cautionary tale. So I I don't see I don't see anything as ever being completely phased out because I think that the full range of human capacity, whether for better or for worse, is always going to be possible and is always going to be present. So it's just a matter it is if it has an audience or not, one way or another. So I think things come and go. I think that there are pendulum swings in taste and in needs. I would like to think that we'll you know, get to a point where we can um, continue to have nuanced discussions about things and it not, you know, cause such divisiveness. Uh, we're in a very, very divisive time right now. And I, I would like for there to be much more intellectual discussions about things without it being something where um, someone is being trampled on. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly would love for there to be less trolling on the internet in the world. That would be great. Thanks. Um, Cause that's just not fun for anybody and it wastes everybody's time and energy. Um, and it's not constructive. Um, so I, I certainly can't see the future. I, I am not a psychic like in the ways that my characters are. And even the, even with my characters, they have, they have lots of limitations, you know, um, about what their fortune telling can hold. But I think there's always gonna be types of stories um, there to be told. It's just a matter of which ones do we wanna focus on and which ones do we wanna uplift? Yeah, and you know, the line between consent and co coercion isn't always for, you know, relationships and fantasy books. Fantasy romance. Do you think this is an issue that writers in the genre have started tackling successfully in recent years? 
I definitely think that the broader discourse about consent, about there being an equal say, um, about just understanding what that even means, I definitely think that that inevitably has already had and will continue to have an effect on fiction. And so, again, I my characters really like to talk and to hash things out with each other. So I, you know, and and often it'll be clear that if something is is not discussed, that's when the problems arise. So I, I sort of lead by example in my characters sometimes, you know, almost over talking things a bit. And, and uh, but at the same time, you can't ever, um, there's no such thing as uh, over consent. There's there's no enthusiastic consent is fantastic in every aspect because everyone has different boundaries. One of the things that Eve is managing in her work at the ghost precinct is the boundaries between her and the ghosts because the ghosts will talk to her 24 hours a day, nonstop. So she has a she has a, a limit at home. When she's done, the ghosts are not allowed in her room. They can float through the walls. They, you know, she can shut the door and they'll float right through. So she has to put a moratorium on when she's allowed to be spoken to because she needs a moment of rest. So she negotiates that. There is a there is a moment when one of the ghosts wants to keep watch because Eve's in danger, but they negotiate that. Um, and so I think that like the way that Eve talks about the boundaries with her spirits, it's also a parallel to just talking about boundaries in life and about respecting those boundaries for everybody. Yeah. And you know, as a fantasy genre, you know, Gas Lamp and Steampunk seem, and historical fantasy in general, they seem to be, well, not historical fantasy in genre, general, but Gas Lamp and steam, Steampunk seem to be feminist and driven by distinctive female characters, perhaps even more than any other form of urban or historical fantasy. Do you think they can, uh, you know, guess them as steampunk can address all these issues that we're talking about? We've been talking about, you know, more effectively than other other genres or subgenres, principally because they are rooted in history and th can thus more directly comment on it. I think in a lot of ways, the the appeal of gas lamp fantasy and steampunk is that it is this alternate setting, but yet it's one that we have an understanding. We already have a general understanding of history. So it allows for a reimagining. And I take certain real aspects of history and then I just sort of shine a light on that and then infuse this fun, fantastical, eerie, paranormal element. I think that because I'm not talking about right now, I think people are allowed to have a bit of an escape to this other, not only is it a different time period, it's a double escape. It's a different time period with these fantastical things. So it serves, that's what's so great about historical fantasy, uh, gas lamp fantasy, steampunk for me, is that we can kind of address things of history that we wanna shed a greater light on and, and tell stories that weren't told. And that's really for me because history is very dynamic. We're finding out more and more about history all the time, especially from people whose voices were put into the margins, from voices that were oppressed voices from all around the world. So, um, you know, the 19th century has a lot of darkness with very imperial and, and colonial horrors happening all around the globe. The, the idea of st steampunk and gaslight and fantasy can begin to kind of like work with those real horrors and try to sort of say, hey, but what if, what if this went a little differently? What And asking the what if, which is the great, the great question of storytelling is asking that what if and, and, and inviting people to come along a journey of possibility. And I am just called, I just feel called to write this style and I think with it um, I can yes comment on stuff that's happening today but I certainly don't want my book to ever feel didactic I don't want my book to feel like it's preaching at anything I just want to write a fun adventure with cool people who are getting stuff done for the greater good and that's because that that to me is affirming and I want to write stuff that is affirming and fun um and I love to be a little scared so I love it if it's a little spooky um but at the end of the day I don't want it to end tragically because I don't there's enough tragedy in the world and I don't really want to live there as a writer 
Yeah, and you know, there's this whole discussion now about, you know, um, because grim dark fantasy has been so popular in the last, I think, 10 years. Um, and you know, there's, there's this whole discussion that's been going on and on and on and on in so many fantasy groups about, you know, maybe it's time the pendulum swung the other way because, you know, real life is already depressing enough, much less, you know, reading even more depressing stuff in, in, in you know, totally. in your time. And, totally. and um, you know, speaking of historical fantasy, a lot of people, a lot, there's a growing number of people going, well, and historians going, well, you know, look at these grim, dark fantasy books saying that, you know, there's violence against women everywhere, even in, you know, from the Middle Ages and stuff. And then they go, well, yeah, but even in, within the same country, there are different laws in different regions. And in certain right. places, women did work. They worked as spinsters. That's where the term spinster came from. Yeah. Or, they, you know, and, and this was before industrialization. Because yeah. industrialized, the great industrialized century in Victorian times, that's when gender roles really became really segregated. Oh, sorry, guys, yeah. if, if any of you are listening to this, we have, it's almost like a history lesson that we're talking about today because right. Yana writes historical fiction with a paranormal twist. So we're talking about women in history and, and women in historical fiction today. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please do uh type them out make sure you're logged into youtube type them out in the chat box next to the screen michelle who's today's chat box moderator and producer will relay them to me to read out to liana and you know we've got about 15 minutes left for you to get your questions in so if you have any questions just you know just um type them in easy peasy um and you know liana just now you were talking about uh not being pedantic and that actually leads nicely into the next question from us which is you know how can authors strike a balance in their storytelling between raising awareness about the issues that we were talking about like violence against women sexism misogyny um, marginalization of people while telling an engaging story without being pedantic or preachy i think that comes down to character making sure that you're that you're really focused on your characters and what their journey is and not getting sort of side, you don't want to go on sort of a, a narrative sidebar telling the reader what to think. That's, you know, and I think sometimes it happens in those narrative passages where you're maybe thinking about what the character is thinking about. And sometimes that can get a, waxing a bit, um, you know, too much off from the, the the present moment at hand. So I think making sure that the stakes for the, the character are very high so that they're constantly chasing that next thing that needs to happen to solve the problem at the inciting incident of the book. Um, and so staying focused on plot and character will help from things being pedantic, but you're just by letting your character live their lives and try to solve problems, they're gonna encounter, you know, I think giving your characters obstacles that relate to these aspects you get to show how to sort of deal with it and you get to show options of how can we deal with this in a positive way that's you know hopefully going to solve the problem for the character yes but also be an example of that greater issue in the world so i think as long as it feels as long as things feel specific to the character that also drive the plot then these things will happen automatically because we go, all of us go through life and we encounter various obstacles. So we have all these examples that happen to us. So you make sure that you give that to your characters. It will be both believable and also be a framework to talk about these discussions. And as long as it stays there and doesn't sort of go into something that feels like the author has inserted their opinion page into it, then you should be okay. Yeah, have have some critique partners that you trust look at your work to make sure that like it doesn't go off the rails somewhere. Yeah, and you know your stories. We were, we were you were talking about female friendship earlier as a, as um, theme in a fantasy um, that's coming that's coming to the fore now. Yeah, you know, after decades and maybe centuries of not putting female friendship 
at the four in fantasy. And you know, your stories definitely pass the Bechdel test with their depiction of complex and interesting relationships between women. Um, why do you think many science fiction and fantasy authors are still having trouble writing stories that pass the Bechdel test, despite the fact that there are hundreds and thousands of things that women talk about other than men? And what can you suggest for writers who want to write female conversations and relationships realistically? I think it comes back to the same thing that I was discussing earlier, which is, you know, solving a problem doesn't have to be about centering somebody else into it. That's not, you know, if you've got two female characters talking about solving a problem, then let them be focused on the problem, not necessarily another character, unless the character is the problem, I guess. But um, but in some ways, I mean, and, and part of that is because there's, you know, there's a there's still sort of a myth uh, sometimes that that is pretty persistent that like men and women can't work together or men and women can't be friends and or, you know, and, and again, there's, you know, there's just a lot of things to sort of dispel. I think there's um, um, there's a whole lot of ways to exist and there's a whole lot of ways to solve problems. And so I think as long as we continue to utilize the vast resource of existence that we have um, and really making sure that um, that the characters feel like they can also share aspects of themselves too. I think issues of self-revelation can be really big in making sure that the narrative doesn't center off on 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 someone um, or something that uh, takes the focus off of the strong characters in the moment. So I think that um, making sure that the characters that are holding the floor, especially women and any marginalized characters, let them continue to hold the floor. Let them continue to, to have that spotlight. And I think then you won't, it won't turn into something where it's focusing again on something else or on, on um, a two-dimensional uh, idea of what relationships could be. Um, I, I, I think that storytelling has a lot more nuance than just, you know, uh, than, than centering dominance. I don't think that that, or, or, or trying to uh, make sure that there's one particular character or one particular thing that's always at the core of it. Um, I think there's lots of different ways uh, to, 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 to talk about and to, to exist and to think and be creative. And so I think for, for me, it's just about, you know, letting your characters be creative as well so that then they feel that they have the full range of human possibility to, um, to, to discuss that, that everything's on the table. Yeah. So we're going to wrap up pretty soon, everybody. So again, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box now and we'll get to them before we wrap up. Um, so let's talk about geek culture. We, we, we talked a little bit about Captain Marvel just now. And, um, you know, but geek culture in general, including science fiction and fantasy, has had its share of critics saying that it's still too male dominated despite having many prominent, well-respected and well-known well female authors such as yourself. And plus, there are plenty of hostile, misogynist and sexist behavior by male geeks towards female geeks. What do you think needs to be done to make geek culture as a whole, whether it's books or gaming or comics or movies, more welcoming for women and girls? I think it's really been important for conventions to have harassment policies in place that has been helpful because I think it's just a matter of of people holding the line about what is and what isn't acceptable. I think that everyone needs to feel that they are able to enjoy something without someone else coming in and um, making that space unwelcoming. So um, I think honestly, for us, uh, you know, for women to to continue to be present to be ourselves to be there and also to to draw the line in the sand about what is and what isn't acceptable i there are i'm not going to put myself in a situation or continue a conversation with somebody who's being hostile towards me i'm just not going to and conventions and places that have moderators and you know people who are filtering out 
the hateful stuff is very, very important. Um, you know, it's it's impossible to exist in this world without somebody being, you know, mean or inappropriate at some point, and that's going to happen. But we shouldn't be afraid of that. Um, we should just we've you know, women in geek culture, we've always been around, and and sci-fi and fantasy women have always been part of content creation as well as fandom, and none of that is new. It's just, you know, whose whose voice has been most often centered. Um, so I think we're seeing a lot of opening up of who is centered in a discussion, and that's fantastic. We're seeing a much wider range of stories and identities and and spotlights. And the more that we have that openness, the I think the, the better that's going to be, the more, because we will then see that we have geeks of all kinds that are here. It's not just, it's not just one, not just, it's not just one thing. And there's not one catch all way in, in which, you know, uh, we're all going to see or perceive geekdom or fandom or things like that. You know, again, there's as many different iterations, um, out there. Uh, and I think that, um, uh, that, both being unapologetic as being geeks is great and being here being present and proud um is wonderful and and that doesn't mean that that's a threat to anybody else you know no no one is no one should feel threatened by the existence of someone else existing the you know no one should feel threatened by that it just should be there's room there's honestly room for everybody and i think that when there's been people trying to police a certain environment or whatever um, in terms of um, saying, okay, well, this is just a this person thing. Well, no, it's making the space welcoming for everybody just means that there's more options. There's more room at the table and that eventually will, um, it's going to make some people mad who can't handle other voices. Well, but at the end of the day, the more voices are here and the more voices are, are calling for tolerance and inclusion. That really is, there's more good out there than there is hatred. I have to believe that. And I want to continue to believe that. And I will continue being in this genre and going to conventions and doing things and putting my work out there um, with hope and not fear. Yeah, and we have come to the final set of questions for today. Um, you know, this is might be a Captain Obvious question. Well, it's a two-part question. Um, you have been so very incredibly supportive of our Read for Pixels campaign and our anti-violence against women work as a whole. So one, why do you support the cause to end violence against women? And two, what do you think authors can do to help with, you know, getting the, you know, keeping the momentum going with the cultural change needed to eradicate violence against women and girls? Well, I'm certainly passionate about ending violence against women because as a woman, it's uh, an issue that is quite critical to the survival of myself and loved ones around the world and, and just people in general. And, you know, we are over half of the population. So um, it, the fact that there is still such a global issue of violence against women, it is, I, it's frankly unacceptable. And, and so I'm somebody who wants to live a humane life myself, and I want that for myself and for others. So it's, and part of breaking down the, the, the fear uh, that leads to violence is about being present and about being um, um, offering perspective. I think when it, it's it's shown with various studies that the more people read about other kinds of people, the less there is violence and the less there is hatred. It opens the mind and it creates empathy. And so we're really at a moment in time here where the world needs a little more empathy because there's been such a rise in hate crimes and there's been such a rise in extremist talk that it's a lack of empathy. So I, I take that cause very seriously and my characters very often are literal psychic empaths because I'm trying to put more empathy quite literally into the world. So for me, I just feel that in presenting 
characters that people can read and get behind and learn something from and cheerlead, then it's that much more possibility to open up people's minds about what it means to be a woman. It means many, many different things. What it means to be someone who's, you know, uh, again, I, I want people to feel themselves represented in my fiction. So I have that range is very, very wide of what that means. And again, for the for that not to be for existence, not to have to be a gendered thing or for emotions not to be gendered, um, because it shouldn't have to be. It's just we're it, we are existing. Um, and so I feel that my duty as a writer is to just um, tell, a fun, tell a fun and engaging story. And in doing that, hopefully I'd like to aid in that empathy uh, journey. Yeah, and you know, reading fantasy and science fiction with all those elements in it, it is almost in a way like, you know, the whole Mary Poppins thing about, you know, spoonful sugar really helps absolutely. absolutely yeah yeah it's and i that's one of the reasons why i do write fantasy because it's really fun and then along the way we can we can talk about some of these things without it being about that um because i think uh, you know there is something to be said for escapism like we were saying with the whole you know i think some people with with the grim dark uh, genre. Some folks want to kind of exorcise uh, and get that, you know, and, and use that as an outlet. And I think that's totally valid. But for some folks, it's too much to take. So I think there just needs to be outlets for everybody, no matter what your persuasion might be, so that you can feel that you have a artistic, creative outlet to read, enjoy, and whatever that isn't um, something that's going to be harmful for yourself or others. Yeah. And so we have come to the end of the discussion session. Um, and I'll just put myself on the screen. If you've joined us like halfway through the session, um, this is what I look like. Ha. Huh? <laughs> yeah, hang on. There we go. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Regina. <laughs> I'm Regina, Yay. the founder and president of the Pixel Project. Um, and um, let's talk about uh, Liana's goodies, if you uh, just joined us halfway through. Um, Liana has generously donated some absolutely gorgeous goodies as treats for anyone who are uh, any fan or any reader who donates to our Read for Pixels campaign. And all the money that you donate, all the funds that we raise, it's going to go keep initiatives like Read for Pixels going and afloat and alive and kicking. And so um, Liana has three Spectral City goodie bundles. Each goodie bundle has a signed and personalized copy of the Spectral City. It's a first edition paperback. Um, there'll be uh, two signed bookmarks and a signed card. All of them have beautiful, gorgeous art um, uh, that's all themed the same as the Spectral City. Um, and there'll be a personal note from Liana herself to you. And uh, if you want something a little extra to go with it, we have two luxury bundles as well from Liana. So you get all the same things as the Spectral City goodie bundle, but one of them has a piece of jewelry. It's uh, reclaimed and restored vintage cameo pendant necklace. I think it looks a little bit like the one Liana's wearing right now, right? It looks very similar to that. Actually, yeah. let me see if I have, did I bring, did I put them right by me? I thought I did. Yes, okay, one of them is this one. Here we are. Yeah, that's the cameo oh, bundle. That's and the cameo. Know? restored it and you know it's handcrafted by Liana and it's uh, of relevance to her books so if you are a fan of Liana's books uh, this goes very nicely with it and the second uh, luxury bundle has a handcrafted vintage necklace there you go if you want something that is not a cameo that's what Liana's crafted just for you um, and um, if you have not read the spectral city liana's got a treat for everyone and she's got three e three copies of the ebook version of the spectral city um and um and you can and we will send you instructions to, to download it after you've donated to get it and it's just just give us a 15 dollars donation per book for that 
and we will send you the code and we will send you the instructions, the link to download, to go down, follow the instructions to download it. Um, and um, there are only a limited number of these exclusive bundles. They're only for US donors only. So if you're in the US, you're in luck. And uh, Leanna will put them, is going to put them together for you with love and care and send them straight to you from her. I, um, I will say that the international international donors can get the ebook copy. So yeah. there's not a there's not a restriction. So if you're an international donor and you'd like to donate, please do and you can get one of the ebooks. So that I wanted to make sure that I didn't leave international folks out. Um, I just couldn't ship the packages, but uh, but the three ebooks absolutely an international um donation we will be happy to get that to you yeah and that's great because um we do know books have regional rights so this is a great thing because um anywhere in the world as long as you have an internet connection and an ebook reader um Perfect. so i'm gonna stick a cute little file well not cute but a little file on screen there we go. To show everyone where to go get it. Uh, can you see it, Leanna? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right. So everyone, if you want to go check out the goodies, Leanna's goodies, um, go to bit.ly slash R4P Rally Up IWD 2019. Now, this is case sensitive. So make sure you take down the exact address. Um, otherwise, you'll, you'll not get sent to the right page. But Take it down, it's case sensitive. And if you want to find out more about the Reaper Pixels program where we have worked with, we have worked with over 100 authors to talk about violence against women in books and geek culture and fantasy and science fiction and genre writing. Um, and we even have a panel sessions that we've recorded if you're a writer. Um, of authors like Jim C. Hines and Kate Elliott talking about writing about violence against women it effectively in fantasy. Uh, go to bit.ly slash read for pixels or you can go to our YouTube page, which you are on now. You can see that right underneath the video. Click on that. There's a whole list, there's a whole playlist of these recorded Google Hangouts um, with authors talking about everything you would like to know about uh writing fiction and reading fiction uh, about violence against women and today in fact liana talked about writing about women and uh, violence against women in historical fiction so this is going to be recorded too if you want to share it with your friends now there will also be plenty of other author goodies available besides liana's if you're interested in other types of uh, fantasy genres um they include Jen Williams, Tana Narif Dew, Caroline Kepnes, Alma Alexander, and more. And we are releasing new goodies every week on Fridays um, to uh, throughout the month of March. So bookmark, bookmark our Rally Up fundraiser page and check in every Friday. Um, hang on. And um, you know, please give generously to help us reach our $5,000 goal. Um, all funds go towards keeping our work to help iron violence against women running. And to find out more about violence against women and what you can do about it, please visit the Pixel Project's website at www.thepixelproject.net. And if you're curious about our first celebrity male role model, who is actually a um, is actually a Nobel Prize Peace Prize winner. Um, go to reveal.thepixelproject.net to learn more about the campaign and to donate and um, help us see. And you can see his arm and his and parts of his shirt already revealed because there's already over 60,000 60, um, pixels revealed. Um, so, well, we will. Now go to Liana, back to Liana before we say goodnight. Liana, do you have any um, anything coming up in the next couple of months that you'd like to tell everyone about? Any well, I, yeah, I'm thrilled that um, the Spectral City has been really going over very well with people. And I also just recently released another book called Miss Violet and the Great War. And it's about a young woman who is called to the front in World War One. 
and it's dealing with that horrific war. It's very, it's a very difficult time period. But again, much like with my other works, I felt called to write a book about hope and love and care in dark times. And so um, that's uh, out with Tor Books right now. And I just released that a couple weeks ago. And I'll have the pretty soon in the next maybe couple months, we'll have the cover reveal and some excerpts up for the second book in the Spectral City universe. It's called A Sanctuary of Spirits, and that will be out this November. So I, it'll be up for pre-order pretty soon. You can pre-order it digitally now, and then the paperback pre-order will come up later. The cover hasn't been finalized yet, so we'll be doing a cover reveal in the next couple of uh, months, and then I'll be doing a lot come October, November, right before release. And then there's a third book in the trilogy, or it might be more than a trilogy, we're not sure yet. Um, so if if the book does well, I would like to continue um, with another couple of books, but as everything is related to sales numbers, so um, so if you're interested, please go pick up a copy so I can write more books. Um, and it uh, the third book will be out in 2020, probably around July. Um, so I'm working on that, I'm drafting that now. And um, so I'm, I'm hard at work on the next fiction. And if, if anyone has questions, I know it's hard sometimes in these limited windows to, to be able to join us. And I know that this, um, this discussion will be up on the YouTube. Um, you're welcome to ask questions online and I will get to them as I can. Um, you can go to my website, which is lianareneheber.com, L-E-A-N-N-A-R-E-N-E-E-H-I-E-B-E-R. That's B as in boy. Um, uh, so LeannaReneeHeber.com. Um, I have a contact form there. I also have a resource guide on my website about writer's resources that were helpful for me when I first started out. So if you go to my free reads page where you can get free stories that I've written if you want to get a taste of the things that I've written um, and, and you don't have the budget to buy a book just yet, you can try a couple of short stories out for free on my free reads page. And then that has a link to my writer's advice column. Same thing on my contact page. It has a link to that as well. Um, and so I'm most active on Twitter and my handle is Leanna Renee. So my first and my middle name. Um, that's where I am most often. I'm very rarely on Facebook. Facebook. Um, I, I am sometimes on Instagram, but uh, the best way if the things I check most often is usually on Twitter. So it's it's every author seems to have like one social media that's like their go to one. And for me, it's Twitter. So but I will also, you know, the contact form on my website does have um, a contact form. Um, if people are curious again, and I'll respond deadlines permitting, provided it's an appropriate message. Yeah, and you know, if, if you know, if if none of that worked for you, you can wait for this video. It's this video is being this session is being recorded. So once it finishes rendering, the comment section will appear at the bottom of the YouTube of the same page that you're on now. You can leave your questions there, and if we and it'll alert us, and if we see anything, we can just send it to Leanna, and she can just answer. Yeah. There. That'll be great. I will be happy to do that at any point. So yeah, don't feel like it's too late to ask a question. Yeah, and it's going to be relevant because you're asking underneath the video too. Um, so oh. let's, I think it's time to say bye to everybody. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Liana, and thank you guys thank so you much. Yeah, thank you guys so much for being with us here today. Um, tomorrow, just to let everyone know, tomorrow at 8.30 p.m., EST Eastern Time, we are hosting Sarah McLean. So if you are yes. into so it's, a, it's another aspect of historical fiction because Sarah McLean is a I love her romance. And she's she so writes, great. She writes the most awesome feminist historical romances. I think it's a little earlier. She does the Regency period, so it's a little oh, earlier yeah. than Victorian yeah. period that Leanna is She's in. amazing. Yeah, so um, tune in tomorrow. Uh, you can go on Twitter to see uh, the link and all. You can tune in tomorrow if you're interested. So from Leanna and us tonight, we bid you thank you and have a good day or good night wherever you are in the world. Thank you.